Our first reading today is from 64th chapter of Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you are angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and in our iniquities, like the wind take us, takes us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and you had delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. And from 1 Corinthians, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I will give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you in to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson is the apocryphal piece in the gospel of Mark, and Jesus is speaking, beginning at verse 24. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the ends of the heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep Awake, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we celebrate this season, as the lights come up, well, may we be aware of the living word come to dwell in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if you and I, if we knew the future, <gasps> if that would Im inform <gasps> how we live in, in <gasps> the present. <gasps> Ex excuse me, excuse me, sir. Welcome to Eastwood's Presbyterian Church on this Sunday, but it seems like you forgot to get dressed. You're in your night shirt, your night garb. A Presbyterian Church? Am I in Scotland? <laughs> this is not where I want to be. I want to be home. How do I get there? Bye. <laughs> This is the beginning of Advent. We're about the beginning of preparing our hearts to get to Christmas. And we're so happy you're here with us. We don't care how you dress when you come to church. Nightshirt and night hat and all. Well, excuse me, but I'm not really interested in celebrating Christmas. I have many, many other things to do. I, Ebenezer Scrooge, have much, much work to do. And I have to get up tomorrow and raise rents and evict people. <laughs> ah! I will not be celebrating Christmas. My nephew and his, son and his family invited me to stay. No! <laughs> ah. Mr. Scrooge, I've heard about you. And I'm wondering if in the recent days or nights, you've had a realization about your past and your future for your present. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Gibberish. I've had no vision. Bah. I am guessing that in the very future, very near future, maybe even tonight, you're going to see things from your past and the future. They're going to change your mind and your heart and your soul forever, Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. I, I think you're absolutely out of your mind, young woman. <laughs> ah, at that, I'm bidding you adieu. Bah. <laughs> Humbug. <laughs> bah. Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, I quote. Ebenezer Scrooge is speaking. I will honor Christmas in my heart, and I will try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past and the present and the future. The spirits of all three strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. End of quote. We have three fascinating lectionary passages this morning as we begin this Advent series of sermons. In Isaiah 64, the people of Israel are remembering the past. They are lamenting the present, and they are seeking to claim a hope in the future. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is responding to a letter that we believe he received that was full of tales of discord and dismute, disputes among this fledging newborn church in Corinth. And Paul does not start out this letter by shaming them or discipline, disciplining them. He prays for them with a prayer of hope for their future. He believes that they have everything they need for that present day by the grace of God. And finally, the, uh, the Gospel of Mark speaks of a cataclysmic end of time that is ultimately a triumph of hope in God's perfect time. 
So in this Advent season, we're going to be pondering a series that focuses really on Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In his life, all of time converges. The past, the present, and the future. The prophetic writer in Isaiah is calling upon God to rend, to tear open the heavens and get down here. Act with cataclysmic power that shakes mountains as God did in the past. Come God, be the superpower, the super agent, providing a witness to the whole world that you are God. Come like you did to Moses in the burning bush, as you did with the plagues in Egypt before Pharaoh and with the parting of the seas, the Red and the Jordan. Meet our leaders, our leaders of the world on a mountain like you did with Moses, giving a Ten Commandments and changing Moses so that his face glowed with your presence. Destroy all those who work for evil in the world. Bring down fire like you did on the prophets of Baal and destroy them. Oh God, we need some pyrotechnics here. Because God, it feels like you've gone silent. We're in deep trouble in our day and age. Have you left us because we have sinned? Because we are dirty like rags? Are you leaving us alone to shape our own future? And as we, people of Israel, return to, Bab- to Israel from Babylon, everything we know lies in ruin. The temple is gone. Our pleasant places are desolate. Destruction is everywhere. God, where are you? Says the prophet Isaiah. And in the midst of that cry comes verse 8. An amazing verse. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. You see, a good, good father invests in his children, molding and making them, holding on to them with a bright and holy hope for the future. Just like a potter who takes a piece of clay and with hands embraces the clay, shapes it and molds it and makes it into something beautiful. The good, good father breaks into the world, tears open the heaven and molds a new future for humanity. And you see, Advent is the season when we get to ask the really hard questions about life. And in those questions, God forms a baby who will grow to be the savior of the world. And God takes a cross and a gruesome death and brings resurrection. And God takes a table that reminds us of Passover and a night of terrible death and brings us life and a new covenant. In the Gospel of Mark, the Greek word schizo is used two times. In chapter 1, verse 10, when the heavens are opened and a dove, the Spirit of God, descends on Jesus at his baptism. And then in Mark 15, verse 38, when the temple curtain is torn from the top to the bottom when Jesus dies. And in the narrative of these amazing stories. Jesus personifies the Son of Man, the one for whom the people of of Isaiah's time are longing for. And in our gospel, it's hard for us to imagine stars falling and the moon no longer reflecting the sun. But Jesus speaks of a cataclysmic event, a triumph of hope when everything will be set right. And that is the hope of our future. 
that which looks like devastation and defeat will ultimately be God's victory. And so we wait patiently. We wait impatiently as a person waits for their beloved to return. This week, I took time at the end of the day to watch uh, the service for our former first lady, Rosalind Carter. Her daughter, Amy Carter, who was a little girl growing up in the White House when I was a younger person, shared a letter that her father, Jimmy Carter, wrote to Rosalind Carter. I quote, My darling, every time I've ever been away from you, I have been thrilled when I returned, just to discover how wonderful you are. While I'm away, I try to convince myself that you really are not, could not be as sweet and beautiful as I remember. But when I see you, I fall in love with you all over again. Does that seem strange to you? It doesn't to me. Goodbye, darling. Until tomorrow. Jimmy. President Jimmy Carter was speaking of a yearning, a longing, a beauty to be in Rosalind's presence. You see, that's the kind of longing, yearning, we are to have for the Christ and his coming in our lives. And so to answer the question at the top of this sermon, the future changes the reality of our present. We stay alert together, and everyone has a role telling the story and drawing us into God's future. The Apostle Paul might have been devastated that this little church that he loved so much in Corinth was having troubles, but he clearly believes that God will gift and guide them above and beyond all of their troubles. You see, that prayer that Paul prayed for that church in Corinth could be our prayer as well. A prayer for us as we move to this table. A table that is gifted to us from the past, meets us here in the present, and draws us into a future where men and women will come from east and west and north and south to sit in the kingdom of God and sit at that feast, the banquet You see, God plants these amazing images of the future in our hearts so that we can live as transformed people in the present. I am so moved when I meet a person who has a vision for the future, and they pour their life into making that future a reality. I love it when you come to me and say, I have an idea. And what happens in this body of Christ as it's manifest in so many places across the globe. Not only does one person have a vision, but another person of a future. Because God is speaking to us, drawing us forward to make this world a better place, that God's kingdom might come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love visions of the future. I enjoy reading about the Wright brothers and their vision to have people fly like birds. It happened, didn't it? And they go all over here on the flightways heading to PDX. Rosalind Carter had a vision of a world where those of us who had people who were mentally ill in our families did not have to hide in shame. Where we could ask for prayers When we have cancer in our family, we can ask for prayers, but we have somebody in our family who has mental illness, we dare not ask for prayer because of what you will think of us and our family. She had a vision of caring for those that are mentally ill and being a nation that was kind and compassionate. And friends, that vision continues to carry us forward. She knew what it was like to care for those who needed so much support in the end of their days or in a, a traumatic illness. And so she had a vision of caring for caregivers. And so many of those visions have come true. As my husband and I dream about what it's going to be like to be really old and who's going to take care of us. 
there are so many pieces that are in place because of a vision that God gave Rosalind Carter. What an amazing gift to be people of God, Advent people, who are open to the very Spirit of God planting visions in our hearts, a vision of a future that is amazing. And so we as a church are called to be believers who live the change we want to see in the future. And so today we talk and we dream and we pray together about a desired future, not only for our lives and our church, but for this world. Because the Spirit of God lives in us. Because Jesus has given us a gift, the best gift of all, himself. To the glory of God, amen and amen. This afternoon, I'm going to be preaching at Unity Family at 1.30. A different sermon if you want to come on a rainy Sunday afternoon. But as I've been working on that sermon, I have re I've returned to the Nicene Creed. And so today, instead of using the Apostles' Creed that we normally do during Holy Communion Sundays, I'd like to invite you to take out a hymn book around you. There should be underneath the seats or right around. And turn to page 15 and stand and let us repeat together the Nicene Creed that was adopted in the 300s as a way to claim the divinity of Christ in a world that was fighting about whether Jesus could truly be God. So let us stand together, page 15, and say what we believe. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And we believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> 